Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. The sack of Panama in 1671 by Henry Morgan was one of the most important geopolitical moments in the history of the New World. It wasn't as big as Columbus arriving on Hispaniola or Cortez conquering the Aztec Empire or the dawn of the slave trade or the introduction of sugar into the economy, but it was a symbol and at the same time a symptom of a very real sea change in the Caribbean. It changed Spanish policy and it signaled a new era of a waning Spanish empire. It proved to the English that they had the weight to exert their will in the West Indies. And it wasn't just there. It was in European politics on a much grander scale as well. This was one of the first major stepping stones to what would become the British Empire. I mean, you can just imagine Louis the Fourteenth hearing of the event and between visits to his mistresses and his fancy parties, conferring with his advisors on exactly how this changed France's relationship with both Spain and England. These are the sort of changes that would lead the balance of power to shift and lead to war, where Spain would ally with their old Protestant enemies in the Netherlands. Now, it was perhaps less important of terms of politics and power than it was to the people who actually lived in Panama. Remember, during the attack, someone lit a fire that burned the city to the ground. Whether it was Henry Morgan or his men or the Spanish commander or some local Panamanians isn't clear, but the city burned nonetheless. And it was one of the pillars of the Spanish Empire. It stood next to Havana and Mexico City and Lima, and it had been utterly destroyed. That event hung over the late 17th century Caribbean, and it influenced everything that came after. It was certainly at the forefront of the minds of the men who sailed on Panama nine years later. In their minds they imagined themselves raiding all of the storehouses and the churches of Panama and walking out burdened with all of the gold and jewels that they would carry. They thought of the wine and the beef and the women that Panama had to offer. They thought of the ships that were riding low in the water from all of the silver. But that was Morgan's Panama. That was the Panama of a Spanish empire at the height of her power. That Panama, one of the greatest cities in the New World, existed now only in their imaginations. That Panama had been destroyed by fire, and it had been wiped from the face of the earth. This is episode 43, Last Man Standing. Of course, for all of the grand dreams and the grim reality that Panama offered, neither of them were at the top priority for the buccaneers after their battle in Panama Bay. Last time when we left off, Captains Coxon and Sawkins and Cook had defeated the armada of the three Spanish galleons from their fleet of canoes. One Spanish ship had fled from the battle, one had been taken by the pirates, and the last had exploded and sunk. Captain Coxon, who was the admiral of the fleet, at least nominally, had taken command of that remaining ship and ordered the wounded brought aboard to be tended by his doctor. Now, his doctor was the best that the pirates had among them. So the doctor cared for all of the men with injuries serious enough to warrant his attention. Eighteen men had died, but there were still twenty-two on board that had musket balls lodged in their bodies, or broken bones, or missing limbs that needed tending. One of the captains, Captain Peter Harris, was among those wounded with a musket ball that had gone through one leg and into the other. Now right here, these men being tended on board that Spanish galleon are worth noting. These are men who are in their 20s and 30s. They're pirates and hardened sailors. But they'd lost their legs or their hands or their eyes. So much of our image of pirates is built around the old sea dog, a peg-legged, hook-handed, eye-patch-wearing old pirate nursing a bottle of cheap rum in a beachside dive in Nassau. And in the days, still decades away, when Blackbeard and Charles Vane are sailing the Caribbean, some of these young men who are being tended on board this Spanish galleon in the Bay of Panama will be those old sea dogs. The young men in Blackbeard's time, who are thinking about joining a life of piracy, well, they'll go down to those dives to buy these men a drink and to hear tales of the time that they attacked Panama from the sea and defeated a Spanish armada. 
These stories, the stories we're telling today, will lead thousands of young people who are abandoned by their government and penniless to turn to piracy. Now, while the wounded were being tended, the assembled captains conferred and questioned the Spanish admiral, Barahona. Those five large ships of the line still lay at anchor in the harbor at Perico, barring their approach to Panama. Now, it was Captain Sawkins that took command of the situation and control of the questioning. His line of questions was about those ships in particular. He wanted to know, most importantly, how strong they were. How many men were on board? How many guns did they have? The pirates right now were bloodied and they were sore, but their only chance to take those ships might be right now before any reinforcements arrived. The admiral told them, quote, In the biggest alone there were 350 men, and that he would find in the rest too well provided for defense against his small number. End quote. Then, a man who was lying on deck, coughing up blood and breathing his last breaths, spoke up. He contradicted the admiral. He told the pirates that those ships were abandoned, that every fighting man had been brought to bear against the English already, that there was no resistance on board. The pirates deliberated. They weren't sure who to believe right here, but they chose to believe the dying man. They believed that a dying man had no reason to lie to them. He had nothing to gain from the situation, so his words must be true. But still, they couldn't be certain. So the pirates reassembled their fleet, and they reloaded their guns, and they began to row over to the five warships. They were prepared to take them, even if it meant another tough fight. About halfway across the bay, though, suddenly a fire bloomed on board the largest ship. Now, it wasn't an explosion, the magazine hadn't been affected, but it would, in time, sink the ship. Now, it appeared that the dying man had told them the truth. If there were any soldiers aboard, they would have been prepared to defend their flagship, not lighting it aflame. However, someone was there, and they'd set fire to the ship in an attempt to deny that ship to the pirates. I do wonder, though, why that dying Spanish soldier told the English that those ships were empty. What did he have to gain? Well, he didn't leave a record of his last thoughts. We can never know for certain, but we can speculate. Perhaps he didn't have nothing left to lose, as the English assumed. He was going to die, but what was he leaving behind? Now, the admiral, doing his job, was trying to delay the pirates for as long as possible, to stall them from entering Panama and give the people time. Time to escape, yes, but also time to get the gold out. So why would that dying soldier help the buccaneers? It might be that in this situation he and the admiral had different goals. If the soldier had a family, a mother and a father, a wife and children, back in the city, well, perhaps they wouldn't be able to escape. Either because they were somehow unable to, they were incapacitated in some fashion, or because the authorities had given precedence to the mules carrying all the gold and silver. Perhaps the dying soldier knew that the pirates would get into Panama, but if they had a fleet of powerful new warships, well, maybe they didn't have to. Or if they did ransack the city, now that he had given them what they wanted, well, they would likely do so gently. It's a long-established military fact that surrendering your city usually means the invaders will forego the usual burning and rape and murder and amicably pillage and plunder and pilfer all the treasure. From time immemorial, though, it's been preferable, if you're going to lose the battle, to surrender your city and to turn over your valuables rather than endure a siege and all of the atrocities that come with it. Perhaps the dying soldier knew all of that, and he chose to surrender those ships and hope that the pirates would be honorable to spare Panama fire and sword. Now, the fire on board that ship was spreading, but the pirates rode harder and they moved faster, and they reached the ship in time to climb aboard and fight the blaze. It was hot and heavy work, especially for men who were already weary after a battle, but they were still in time. So they claimed this largest Spanish warship, her name was La Santissima Trinidad, or the Blessed Trinity. Now, if you've been listening to the show for a while now, you might be thinking to yourself, another Santissima Trinidad? How many is that now? See, 
The pirates that we've covered so far, even up to this relatively early date, have taken more than one ship that had basically that same name, and then there have been at least two that were a variation of the Nuestra Señora de la Concepción. The problem here is that the English were ignoring the full names of these ships. What the English called the ships was more of an honorific than a name. About a hundred years after these events, the Spanish will christen another ship, La Santissima Trinidad, but her full name will be La Santissima Trinidad del Buen Fin. See, whether they were named Nuestra Señora de la Concepción, which is Our Lady of Conception, or Immaculate Conception, or Santissima Trinidad, the Blessed Trinity, that wasn't their name. They were classes of ships. In the modern Spanish Navy, they have a Santa Maria class of heavy frigate. Rather than name their ships like the English do, his or her royal majesties this or that with their HMS, they chose to name their ships to honor their faith. That would be like the Spanish taking an English ship and calling that Her Royal Majesty over and over again. But none of that mattered to the pirates who took the ships in the bay at Perico. They called their new ship the Trinity, and they set about getting her seaworthy. Now this was quite an upgrade for the pirates. They went from a fleet of canoes to the most powerful ship in the Panamanian Navy, this ship could rival any of the warships in the Southern Ocean. The smaller ship that was carrying the wounded was sailed over and the wounded were transferred to the Trinity, where they'd be a lot more comfortable. See, remember that the pirates didn't believe in officers' cabins and captains' quarters. They slept communally. On the other hand, the Spanish Navy had amazing officers' quarters, some of the finest of any navy in the world, so the wounded were transferred to beds with down pillows and silk sheets. Then they began to explore the other ships in the fleet. Each of the pirates left their canoes and took up lodging on one or another of the Spanish warships. So for the night they had shelter, a highly defensible position, and plenty of wine and food to enjoy. The following day was Saturday the 24th of April, 1680. The Spanish sent an ambassador out from Panama to treat with the pirates, Sawkins greeted him with coxswain in tow. They desired peace from the pirates, and they were prepared to bargain for the safety of Panama. Now, one of their captives, that Spanish Captain Peralta, who was, if you remember him, that old and stout Spaniard who dived in to save the slaves thrown overboard after his ship exploded, well, he argued in favor of the English. He spoke of their honor and their nobility in the fight. And... Probably, his thoughts ran along those same lines as that dying soldier. They all agreed that the pirates could have the Trinity, and whatever other ships they could successfully man. Now, it wasn't like the Panamanians had any choice here. The pirates already had the ships, and the Spanish had no soldiers left and no ships to take them back. But the pirates only had enough men to crew three of the ships, even when Sharp returned with his crews from collecting water. So the Spanish argued that if left the other two ships, they wouldn't retaliate. They couldn't crew them anyway, but Sawkins took a party of officials on board the first of these other ships, the ones that were the least important to the English. On board they found a cargo of iron bars, which was expensive and sold for quite a bit of money, but the Spanish claimed that they had no need for these bars. They were ambivalent to them entirely. So, naturally, Sawkins had the ship burned and sunk. Imagine that. You've got Sawkins and the Spanish ambassador and Basil Ringrose there to translate. The ambassador says, No, no, this ship? Oh, it's just iron bars. Nothing important. Nothing valuable here. Why bother with this ship at all? And Sawkins replies, oh, you don't care about this cargo? Totally unimportant? Okay, then we'll just burn the ship. And it was absolutely vital to Panama. In the daylight, they could see the city from on board this ship. They could see the state that it was in. In 1680, Panama was mostly built of wood. Their houses were, for the most part, modest, single-family homes, and that was an upgrade. There had certainly been a time after old Panama had burned when shacks and multi-family bunkhouses had been the order of the day, and there were still plenty of those around. Now, today, you can actually visit the ruins of old Panama. 
Panama Viejo, on the outskirts of Panama City. That's the ruins of the city that burned when Morgan attacked. You can visit the church there and see from the church the skyscrapers of Panama City proper. If you're visiting Panama, it's a must-see attraction. But while you're there, you'll likely also want to go see the Casco Viejo. That's the old quarter of Panama City. Now that's what the pirates were looking at in 1680. The same land. It's filled today with some of the greatest examples of colonial Spanish architecture to be found anywhere in the world. You can see the Cathedral Basilica Santa Maria, La Antigua de Panama, which is a gorgeous building. Panama is one of the major metropolitan centers of the Western Hemisphere, but that cathedral and that old quarter stand as a reminder of our centuries-long history and what was at one time the greatest empire on earth. But none of that existed when the pirates visited Panama. The fleet and all of the men in her imagined a city that Morgan had visited a decade earlier, but what they found was a village. A large village, certainly, but there was none of that monumental stone architecture. There were none of those great houses of wealth of old Panama. Now, this city lay about five miles from the ruins of the old city. The church, that cathedral basilica, didn't exist yet. They hadn't even begun construction on it. They visited the church back in old Panama, which still stood mostly intact after the fire, so it was still in use. Now, it wasn't their primary house of worship, but on feast days and on memorials, the people of Panama would make that five-mile trek to their old church. There they would hold service in remembrance of their fallen. Now, that actually might explain why today the ruins of that old church are still there. Why the locals didn't cart away the stone to build up their new city. It served for them as a memorial. But... Standing on that deck, ordering his men to burn the ship that were carrying maybe a hundred tons of iron bars, Sawkins knew what a state Panama was in. He knew just how much they needed that iron to rebuild their city. And still, he ordered the ship sunk. But then their little procession moved on. The ambassador, Sawkins, Coxon, and Ringrose went on to the other ships, and on them they found cargoes of furs and soaps and dyes and spices and occasionally some money, some gold and silver. The last ship, though, the smallest and weakest of the warships, they found a little bit of flour and meal. Now, they probably took some of it, but mostly they left it on the ship and then they burned that one as well. All of this took the better part of a day, and when dusk came, they'd yet to reach an agreement. They intended to reach that agreement the following day, but when dawn came, it was clear that there was trouble afoot. Not from the Spanish side, but from the pirates' own ranks. There was a rift growing between Sawkins and Captain Coxon. They were arguing openly in front of the men on exactly what course was best, whether to raid Panama and continue their voyage, or to take the spoils and leave. The men were split between loyalty between the two commanders, and they were quietly preparing for a fight. But then the doctor, Coxon's doctor, approached with hard news. Captain Peter Harris had died. He'd succumbed to his wounds, finally. Ringrose writes, quote, Two days after our engagement, we buried Captain Peter Harris, a brave and stout soldier and a valiant Englishman. Born in the county of Kent, whose death we very much lamented. He died of the wounds he received in the battle, and besides him only one man more. All the rest of our wounded men recovered. End quote. This loss of one of their companions and one of their commanders and his burial seems to have alleviated the pressure between Sawkins and Coxon. Those three captains, Peter Harris and John Coxon and Richard Sawkins, were old comrades, after all. They probably served in the war together, and they sailed alongside each other on innumerable excursions, as well as the raid on Santa Marta. And it seemed that at this moment the two captains might come to an agreement. But then, in sailed Captain Bartholomew Sharp. During the battle, he'd been away collecting water with 
the two Spanish barks they'd taken. The two crews that went with him were those that most hated Coxon. That expedition made for water was likely made, at least in part, to keep Captain Sharp and those men away from Captain Coxon. But now they were returned, and just as the rift was beginning to close between those two older captains, the younger and fierier Captain Sharp ripped it back open. His men began speaking with those who had taken part in the battle. They learned all about Captain Coxon's actions, how he'd stayed back from the fighting, how he'd let Captain Sawkins and Harris take the lead in every attack, how he'd avoided contact with the Spanish at every turn. Now this disgusted the pirates, especially the crew of Captain Harris, who just died. Their admiral was a coward, and he'd gotten their captain killed. However, before Sharp returned, most of Harris's crew wasn't there. They'd gone with Captain Sharp. Before Sharp returned, the numbers of crewmen split between Sawkins and Coxon were more or less equal. Now, though, with Sharp returned, and with all of his men as well as Harris's, the scales had suddenly and dramatically tipped in favor of those who wanted Coxon out. They saw him as nothing more than a lily-livered, yellow-bellied coward. He was a sorry excuse for a sailor, and he was hardly a pirate at all. Coxon was out as commander. He had a choice here, either to take a lesser position and risk the hatred and perhaps the knives of men who already hated him, or to abandon the expedition altogether. Ringrose once again writes, quote, Captain Coxon, being much dissatisfied with some reflections which had been made upon him by our company, determined to leave us and return back to our ships in the northern seas. The main cause of those reflections was his backwardness in the last engagement with the Armadilla, concerning which point some sticked to defame or brand him with the note of cowardice. Unto this effect he persuaded several of our company, who sided most with him and had the chief hand in his election, to fall off from us and bear him company in his journey overland. End quote. Captain Bartholomew Sharp writes, quote, Captain John Coxon, with fifty men, persuaded the Indians to return back, being a little in disgrace amongst our men. As something tainted with cowardice in the late action, which made him leave us and take with him his surgeon and most of our best medicines, not having any consideration or respect for our wounded men which we had on board, as a man of moral honesty ought to have had, thus making our retreat the more unsafe by taking away fifty sound men, and then leaving us destitute of remedies for the recovery of our wounded and sick. But this last thing was unknown to the rest of our company. End quote. So Coxon was out, he'd left the fleet, and he'd taken one of the barks and a large number of men. Now Sharp says fifty, and Ringrose says it's closer to seventy. Either way, though, it's clear that he did take the medicines and their best surgeon with him. Now they still had Lionel Wafer, who was also trained in medicine, but without a proper medicine chest. Considering the actions that Bartholomew Sharp would take later in life, it's funny to hear him defame another pirate as a man of no moral honesty, but that's still, well, it's still pretty awful to take everyone's medicine. Now, if you'll bear with me here, I'd like to examine something. Perhaps it's true that Coxon was simply a coward. Perhaps, and it's possible, he suffered from PTSD after the war, and when he was engaged in a fierce naval battle, he couldn't cope. But he had done so before. For years now, he'd taken ships and settlements with no sign of this kind of issue. He'd been a very successful pirate, so successful that he'd been elected admiral by these men. So why now become a coward? What happened? Several episodes ago, I discussed a possible conspiracy theory. I brought up the possibility that this entire voyage, from Port Royal to Portobello, across the Isthmus and into the South Sea, was actually backed by the English government. That Lieutenant Governor Henry Morgan and former Governor Thomas Moody Ford and possibly even the current Governor, maybe even the Lords of Trade, perhaps the Lord High Admiral James, Duke of York, and yes, possibly even King Charles II, all conspired to send this armada of pirates into the South Sea on a, a sort of reconnaissance mission. They were, we know, interested in the South Seas territories of the Spanish Empire, and 
Well, they weren't at war, so it would have been a diplomatic nightmare to send ships in to do that. So now, perhaps they chose to use the pirates. But let's not forget the Jewish element in all this. Marine archaeologists are still uncovering the extent of the Jamaican Jewish community's role in Port Royal's piracy, but it can't be overlooked. Of course, there were just Jews on board all of these pirate voyages, from Mings and Mansvelt down through Morgan, and even on this voyage, there were young Jewish men sailing with the pirates. But that was nothing compared to the Jews back in Port Royal. If you'll recall, these were descendants of Jews that had been forcibly and violently removed from Spain after the Reconquista. They had good reason to back the piratical actions against Spain, but more to the point than mere petty revenge, they had real financial motivation to see the Spanish power removed from the New World. See, they'd chosen to stay in Jamaica after England invaded and took it over from Spain. The English and the Dutch as well, were actively working to welcome and incorporate Jews from Catholic Europe into their Protestant nations. And Catholic Spain and France chose not to do business with Jewish merchants, at least in the New World, unless absolutely forced to do so. The Jewish merchants who already had the infrastructure for trade on Jamaica had become the backbone of the sugar economy there. However, that economy was severely limited by a dominant Spanish empire. So, what to do? If you're the English on Jamaica, you want the Jews in your community to be able to trade freely. If you're the Jews in Jamaica, you want to be able to trade freely. But Spain was making that very difficult. So perhaps the best course of action here, when diplomacy was not an option and warfare was for now out of the question... You bankroll a bunch of pirates on a mission of pillage and plunder against the most powerful Spanish city in the region. Regardless, though, of who was behind the expedition, and if there was a grand conspiracy here, it was probably a mixture of all of them, there's a strong case to be made that they were there to test Spanish defenses and to scout the region. Should war between Spain and England break out, that would be necessary information. Now, in that episode where I brought it up, I argued that if that were the case, John Coxon had been in on all of this from the start. He was the very first pirate involved in the mission. It was him that brought in Sawkins and Sharp. If it was all his idea, fine. But if not, only he'd had any contact with their shadowy backers. Maybe he had orders. Maybe, due to... Panama's sensitive nature as a rich storehouse of Spanish wealth and also their emotional standing vis-a-vis Panama's recent burning and their stature in the Spanish mind, well, maybe Panama wasn't to be attacked. Maybe it was too hot to touch for England. Maybe they wanted to avoid the political and diplomatic fallout that would occur if Panama was attacked and the warfare that was likely to break out. Perhaps... Coxon had specific commands not to attack Panama, but rather to steal some ships and sail south along the Pacific coast of the Americas. It was there that England had their primary interest. It was there that England would make inroads into the continent. Maybe that's why John Coxon balked at attacking Spanish vessels. Maybe that's why he insisted again and again that they turn back from Panama and sail south, Maybe that's why he made excuses and tried to turn the men from their course of action. And maybe, just maybe, that's why he turned back and headed home for Panama. But either way, Coxon's tenure on this voyage was done. Now we'll see him again when we do. Well, I don't want to spoil it. But if all of this about him working unofficially for some rich guys in powdered wigs... Well, I think his next moves will make a good case that he is. But that's not for some time yet. For now, John Coxon had his tail between his legs and was marching back across the Isthmus in the company of their best surgeon and the remaining Kuna people. Now, it very likely might be that the Kuna were just ready to turn back and go home. Their enemies in Santa Maria and Panama had been attacked and defeated. But, as the pirates would argue, vociferously, in both their memoirs and in court cases some years later, 
they were actually working with the Kuna people as allies. They were following a formal request for aid against the Spanish. Now, there's no record of that request in the English archives, but the Kuna were well known to both the pirates and to regular merchantmen, and even the English navy. They were well known enough that the Kuna regularly made voyages to Port Royal to trade and to treat with local officials there. So, perhaps they too were with Coxon on official business, and now that business was concluded. So they all turned back. But then, some 300 or so pirates who had Spanish warships now decided to ignore that official mandate and go a-pirating in the South Seas. To that end, the buccaneers needed a new admiral, though. There was Sharp, of course, and he had a lot of loyal men, and there was also Edmund Cook and John Cook, who were respected captains, but really, now that Peter Harris was dead, there was only one obvious choice. They elected Richard Sawkins their new admiral. This was, in my opinion, the right decision. He was brave, and he was thoughtful, and he was capable, and he was one of the greatest pirates ever to have sailed the high seas. However, after all of that drama, Captain Coxon decided, with the input of his men, not to attack Panama. They reached an agreement with the negotiators, with several caveats we'll get to shortly, and took their three ships and just sailed away. I think more than reaching an armistice, though, they chose to do so on two grounds. First, well, the holds of their three ships were already pretty full. They had a rich haul of valuable goods. Of course, if they found a trove of silver and gold, they could throw some of their other stuff overboard, but... For now, it was pretty good. Second, though, there's the state of Panama. It was not the jewel of the Caribbean. It was still a ramshackle, struggling colony. The damage caused by Morgan's raid and the fire, well, that was all still being repaired. And Panama itself was still being built. So it would be dishonorable to attack them while they were still picking themselves up. Plus, I mean, how much could they actually have? But then, as they were sailing out from Panama, another ship came sailing in. It was not large, but it was well-armed. Not a ship of the line, but a first-rate Spanish galleon. One wonders if the pirates chose to fly the flag of Spain when their three warships surrounded the galleon, if the Spanish captain on board her wondered at exactly why he was being stopped. And how the three large ships were even crewed, where the Panamanians found so many men to sail them. He knew, after all, precisely how many soldiers there were serving in Panama. He had to. It was his job. He was there to bring them their pay. 60,000 pieces of eight in all. And when the 300 English pirates on board the three warships made themselves known and began to board his ship, it was clear that... Those Spanish soldiers weren't getting their pay. That's, according to Sharp at least, a share of 247 pieces of eight per man, even after the allotments had been made for injuries and commanders and the like. For those who are keeping track at home, that's two and a half times what the men on Morgan's raid got. And that's not including the value of their stolen cargo, which was easily that much again, maybe even more, maybe a lot more. And that isn't including their haul from back at Portobello or their gold dust taken from Santa Maria. And now they had three well-armed and immaculately maintained warships filled with the New World's most valuable cargoes, and every man had enough coin in his possession to spend months back in Port Royal. He could enjoy himself in whatever debaucherous way he pleased. They could buy casks of wine and baubles for all the women and enough company not to have to spend a night alone for months and months. It would be totally understandable if they chose to turn back and enjoy the rewards after these weeks and weeks and months of hardship. But they chose not to. They would press on. They would sail the southern ocean and see just what they could see. And that being said, though, it didn't mean that the pirates didn't desire a night of debauchery ashore. They'd turned away from Panama, which meant denying themselves all of the pleasures available to them there. 
but they turned their eyes elsewhere. Just a few leagues away, an island called Toboga lay. There was a town on the island by the same name of about a hundred houses, and an ample harbor to house their ships. The pirates made for that island, and as they were disembarking, the inhabitants fled before them into the jungle. The pirates weren't after them, though. They weren't there to murder or rape or torture. They had pockets full, after all. What they were there for was... drink. Every home had a store of rum and wine, and the pirates wanted to do everything in their power to see that none of it survived come morning. Now, as you might expect, they defiled the church, which had become something of a tradition for the Protestant pirates, and yeah, they searched the houses for valuables, but they didn't find much. These were relatively poor people, and they wouldn't have had many riches to speak of. Any they did, they would have carried on their person. And I think it's important to note that these riches weren't frivolities. Sure, whenever they raided a governor's house, they could take his wife's jewelry and his copious amounts of silver plate and raid his coffers, and the governor and his family would be fine. And yeah, they could take the gold cross from the church and the silver chalices from mass, but it's not like the priests were going to go hungry. Now, it might be deeply offensive and sacrilegious, but no one's going to starve. But when I talk, and I often do, about the locals running off with their valuables, the sort that Francois Lolonnet and Henry Morgan tortured people to discover, well, those were necessities. Most of those families had very little else. They had a small parcel of land, maybe a few animals, and only a tiny amount of actual coin. Mostly they could barter for what they needed, but for some vitally important purchases, they needed coin. It was for those few things, and having a bit stored away for hard winters or poor crops, that those were the only reasons they had any coin at all. I mean, it's not like these people had bank accounts. Those few coins that these peasants had were all that they had. If the pirates took those, they very likely might starve to death, or at least be forced to take charity from the church just to survive. But in this raid, none of that was taken. Now, they did take the cargo of a small bark in the harbor. She carried dozens and dozens of chickens and a few other assorted fowl, along with feed for them. This was actually pretty major for the pirates, and possibly it changed their plans quite a bit. See, for as long as the feed lasted, they would have a steady supply of fresh eggs to keep the men fed and nice and healthy. They could last for months with the amount of feed they had, and when that did begin to run low, they could just butcher a few of the chickens for their fresh meat and stretch the feed until they finally had a chance to replenish their stores. Now that was good, and it was helpful, but it was the booze they were after. And the pirates did take quite a bit of that too, all they could hold, but one group got a bit rambunctious and started a little fire. And the fire grew, and the house that they were in went up. And it actually probably was accidental. See, the pirates were not that different from those peasants we were just talking about. They knew how hard the common Spanish citizen had it. In fact, it was that repressive system of social control, as much as their religion, that led the English to hate the Spanish. They would go on at length about how peasants and slaves and Indians were treated by the Spanish. Now, that's pretty hypocritical, honestly, but it was something they believed in a major motivation. So, these drunken pirates, who had just set a house on fire, spent the next few hours hauling water and forming lines to fight that blaze. It wound up claiming twelve houses, but... In all, they got the fire under control pretty quickly. But imagine what it looked like the next morning, when a delegation of Spanish officials arrived from Panama. There were 300 hairy, soot-covered English barbarians occupying a small village which, in places, was still smoldering. Now that delegation was there for two reasons. First, they had a party of merchants with them. The merchants were there to... Well, they haggled with the pirates, which is pretty bold when you think about it, but they were professionals. 
They were haggling over the price to buy back all of the cargo taken by the pirates only a few days prior. I mean, that's got to sting. Being forced to buy back your goods a second time from men who just stole them? But, you know, what are you going to do when they have all of the ships and all of the guns? However, if you're these merchants, apparently you haggle. But the more official part of this landing party was that delegation who brought a message from the president of Panama. It asked the pirates why they'd come into his lands, seeing that England and Spain were currently at peace. You see, it still wasn't totally clear to the Spanish that times had changed. These men were not just petty bandits. Pirates and brigands throughout all of recorded history had boarded ships and robbed men on the road, but these men were here to make war. They were just doing it without any official commission. Captain Sawkins replied, though, that he did have a commission. Not from the English governor, but from the rightful king of these lands. He told the president of Panama that he fought on behalf of the emperor of Darien, of King Goldencap of the Kuna, from whom Spain had stolen these lands. I mean, that is bold. But honestly, not unlike many of the United States conflicts after World War II, we're always fighting on behalf of someone else, at least ostensibly. We're aiding some smaller power against the forces of their oppression. The Koreans, the Vietnamese, the Kuwaitis. Even in the world wars, we were there to support our allies. And it's not untrue, but it's not the whole truth. And neither was what Sawkins said. Ringrose recorded his message to the president. It read, quote, if he pleased to send us five hundred pieces of eight for each man, and one thousand for each commander, and not any farther to annoy the Indians, but suffer them to use their own power and liberty, as became the true and natural lords of the country, that then we would desist from all further hostilities and go away peaceably. Otherwise, that we should stay here and get what we could, causing them what damage was possible. End quote. His demands as a median estimate, come to 150,000 pieces of eight. That would bring the total for every man in the fleet, including Portobello, Santa Maria, their price for the goods taken from Panama, to roughly 1,000 pieces of eight each, and double that for the commanders and the wounded. That probably would actually have been enough to pack up and go home. But it wasn't all bluster that Sawkins had. He learned from the delegation that the Bishop of Panama was actually a man that he already knew. It was that same bishop that had been taken from Santa Marta several years prior, the man that Sawkins and Coxon had kidnapped and then delivered into the hands of the Jamaican governor. He was too important a person and too valuable a commodity for them to hold. It would mean war, potentially, and certainly death for the pirates if they did. So Sawkins, who had gotten to know the bishop while he was their prisoner, set aside several loaves of raw sugar and a few other valuable sundries and ordered them delivered personally to the bishop as a gift. The delegation left before sunfall to deliver his message, and the pirates continued to drink themselves into oblivion. The next day, though, the delegation returned. They brought with them a gold ring for Captain Sawkins, which had been sent by the bishop in thanks for the present. They also had the president of Panama's reply. He wasn't buying any of this fighting on behalf of the Indians nonsense. The pirates were Englishmen, so who should he turn to to make a formal complaint of the wrongs done to his people and their property? In short, he wanted to know who gave them their commission. Captain Richard Sawkins replied in what might be the greatest line from any pirate story ever. Quote, as yet all his company were not come together, but when they were, we would come and visit him at Panama, and bring our commissions on the muzzles of our guns, at which time he should read them as plain as the flame of gunpowder could make them. End quote. I mean, that's just too good. Yeah, you want a commission? I'll show you my commission. Why don't you come here and take a look? If the Spanish president still thought that the old rules applied here, he was rudely corrected. We're here because we can be. We have your guns. We have your ships. Exactly what are you going to do about it? Captain Sawkins is quickly becoming my favorite pirate to date. 
The Spanish president, of course, wasn't going to do a thing. There was nothing he could do. Luckily for him, though, the pirates were already preparing to head out. They'd captured a passing ship while in town, and though it didn't hold anything valuable, it did have some intel for them. There was another rich prize sailing their way, a treasure galleon from Lima hauling 100,000 pieces of eight to Panama. Now, naturally, the returning delegation didn't bring the gold that Sawkins had demanded, but the treasure ship was nearly as good. Plus, that would make a great story back home. Taking a prize like that would be one of the things that would make him a legend. So the pirates sailed away from Toboga. They made landfall at an island called Otok, where Basil Ringrose had time to finish a draft of his account of the battle. And then they sailed on to a place called Kiboa, where they raided a virtually unguarded pearl fishery. The pearl fishery would mostly have been enslaved natives and a few guards, but not to guard the fishery, rather to guard the slaves, so nothing that would deter the pirates from such a rich haul. After Kiboa, they sailed to a place called Puebla Nueva on the mainland. On the way there, they lost a bark in a pretty terrible storm with 15 men on board. Now, surely that can't be an omen, and nothing bad could ever happen at Puebla Nueva. It was May 22nd when they hit the mainland. They'd spent several days at each of their stops, and a month had passed since Panama. They'd lost 70 men when Captain Coxon had left, plus an additional 15 to the storm, and three, including Captain Harris, due to the battle against the Spanish. There were still several men that were injured a little too severely to take part in any battle, so their numbers were smaller, but they didn't think that this small town, Pueblo Nuevo, would give them any trouble. Captain Sawkins took Captain Sharp and their 60 best men with him on board the remaining bark under Captain Edmund Cook. Basil Ringrose and William Dampier were ordered along with them. They were accounted good men and good fighters. So the three captains sailed the bark, which was the smallest ship they had, up the Santa Lucia River as far as she would go. When the ship was unable to sail any farther, the men climbed into their boats and continued upriver. They came to a place in the river, though, where the trunks of a few dozen large trees blocked their path. So the men climbed out of their boats and trekked overland to the tree line. There was a large savanna surrounding Puebla Nueva, cleared by the locals. There were defenses built in there as well, breastworks and barricades, palisades. They had all been erected surrounding the town in vital locations. From the tree line, Captain Sawkins surveyed the situation. He knew that this would be a tough fight. The people there were prepared and apparently well-armed. He saw cannons and many men carrying well-oiled muskets. They were deliberating turning back rather than attack Puebla Nueva. They had already gotten plenty of loot to justify avoiding what would clearly be a hard fight. But just then, Captain Sawkins rushed forward from the tree line and pulled his pistol. He took aim and he fired. They had been spotted by a young Indian man, and Sawkins had shot him through the head before anyone else even realized that he was there. Sawkins rushed back to his men. The option to flee was now gone. The men in Puebla Nueva knew just where they were. They'd heard his gunshot. So Sawkins bellowed at his men, quote, Follow me and do not lie behind, for if I do amiss, you will all fare the worse for it. End quote. Then Captain Sawkins charged forward. His men charged forward as well, following close behind him, but still, Sawkins ran out in front, calling out a battle cry. It was brave and it was bold. It was exactly the quality that Captain Coxon lacked. It was the sort of action that a man who would threaten the president of Panama with execution would make. It was also, of course, incredibly stupid. Captain Sawkins, on his charge, was shot and killed on the approach. The charge immediately faltered. The men grabbed their fallen admiral and several other men who had been shot in the first volley, and they retreated. Ringrose writes of Sawkins, quote, A man who was as valiant and courageous as any could be, the best beloved of all our company. Neither was this love undeserved by him, for we ought to justly attribute to him the greatest honor we gained in our engagement before Panama. End quote. The pirates ran. They fled to their boats with as much haste as possible. They rowed downriver into their bark. Then they sailed as hard as possible. But 
They went a little too fast. They didn't know the land and they ran aground. It beggars belief here, but at just that moment they spotted a passing bark. They rowed their boats over to her and took the ship and sailed her back to their fleet. That ship that they had just miraculously come across was laden with indigo and butter and pitch. When they got back to the ship, well, the men took the news of their commander's death hard. It seemed like a bad omen and also just a disastrous turn of events. He was the best among them. So 75 more pirates chose to abandon the expedition and travel home. William Dampier and Lionel Wafer, well, they were unsure of what to do. They strongly considered going with them. They were both of the same mind about the voyage now. They realized not only was it potentially doomed, but that more and more the actions they were taking were likely to make them outlaws back in England and even potentially cost them their lives. Wafer was in fact most interested in studying the Indians of the region, and Dampier was interested in the wildlife and weather patterns. But Basil Ringrose, who was a member of a sort of cabal they had created, those three educated Englishmen, he convinced them to stay. He was much more invested in the journey, and he wanted more than anything to see where it would take them. In Captain Sharp's account, he names those who abandoned the voyage here traitors and mutineers. But it was within their rights, it was their prerogative as pirates to go when and where they chose. They took that bark with them that had just been taken, leaving only about 200 men in the three ships of the fleet. Those who were left took time to mourn the death of Captain Sawkins. He was truly the most beloved of them. For a time, even after those 75 had left, the entire fleet considered sailing home as a group. But Captain Sharp spoke up, and he gave an impassioned speech and convinced them all to stay the course. All that was left to them was to elect a new admiral, and, in Sharp's own deeply self-important words, a general. There wasn't really a choice here. There was Edmund Cook, but he wasn't even interested. He took his name out of consideration, and then there was really only one man left standing. Admiral Bartholomew Sharp. Next time, we'll look at the first weeks of the voyage under their new admiral. Sharp was a much more impetuous and hot-headed commander than his predecessors had been, and more ruthless. The voyage will take on a new, more violent character under the new admiral, and due to voices like those of Lionel Wafer and William Dampier, a new conflict will arise among the buccaneers. I'd like to thank everybody who has helped to support the show, everybody who has left us a rating or a review, everybody who has subscribed or liked on YouTube, everybody who has recommended the show to your friends or family, and everybody who has signed up to become a patron on Patreon. Without all of you, I wouldn't be able to do this, so thank you. Special thanks to our Patreon Commodore class, Kane, Kenway, Hefei, Jennings, Two-Gun Tony, Drunken Dak, Antonio, the Pirate Nopales, Matthew the Navigator, Bull, Vertigon, Conifalinde, Rumgut, and Bootstraps Bailey. For access to our many rewards, which include exclusive episodes, audiobook readings, and our thank you gifts such as the Pirate History Podcast map, t-shirt, and pin, go to patreon.com slash piratehistorypodcast. As always,